there's a moment where you sort of come out of yourself when you're beyond pain, you're beyond fatigue. Something enters into you where the art sort of takes over. So you spiritually, psychically, psychologically, you're no longer yourself. It does it through you. First and foremost, you have to understand yourself. And then you can understand your adversary. And if you get those two things, then it's yours. I never belonged to these fencers who wanted to be just okay. I always wanted to win. Fencing has become much faster, much more athletic um, than classical fencing period where fencing was actually judged somewhat on, on form and technique as well as on touches given and received. So in some respects it was more like gymnastics or figure skating where the intent of the fencer was to score a touch but how they did it was critical. If you can hit without being hit and apply the art and science correctly in the process, that is winning in traditional fencing. Later, change the concept, it's a martial art, it's a fight. As fencing has evolved into a competitive sport, modern fencing has been judged on purely on touches given and received in competition. So, if it's a martial art, winning is the important thing. As that has happened, there is, needless to say, less time to think. A fencer has approximately a twentieth of a second to, to see an attack develop and about a twentieth of a second to decide what to do about it. You already know in advance what your intention is, but the adversary knows that, and so it almost becomes like third and fourth intention, what you're trying to, to do. Okay, I know that he knows, but does he know that I know that he knows? And so sometimes you don't even complete an action because you know that it's not going to work because the other person already knows that that's coming. Thinking, like in chess, three steps ahead, but the only problem that comes is when your opponent's thinking seven steps ahead and you're still at three. <laughs> And if he does know, then does he know that I know that he knows? Fencing is 50% reflex, 50% strategy. That, you know, if someone comes at me, and I don't have time to think. What should I do? Got to parry. There is a good deal of, of thinking and awareness that go on at the blinding speed that it's happening when one's mind is tuned and, and you're very focused on the moment. It's almost as though it's in slow motion. For example, when you're going to make that attack, you may make an attack that you know that he knows how to respond to. But I know how he's going to respond to it, so I do it anyway, so that I can get that response from him and then use it to hit him. I think if you think about it too much, or I find if I do, then it, you're so much concentrating on what you think is going to happen, then it sometimes doesn't happen and you can, you can get behind. But it's always good to go on with a plan and watch them. I think the most important thing is not to let them do what you know they like doing. From a spectator's point of view, it looks almost kind of dance-like. 
that largely has to do with the fact that it's an art and science. That sword, that weapon that you're using becomes your instrument and you can play that instrument with a virtuosity that no one else has. With anybody involved in any art, whether it be music, whether it be dance, painting, there's just something that clicks. And when it's there, you know it's there. Like a musician who's supposed to learn the instrument, the fencer has to manipulate with the weapon, so it's like an art, the art of fencing. There is, of course, a great deal of talk of a distinction between what was termed in the past classical fencing and the kind of competitive fencing that is generally seen in the World Championships and the Olympic Games. Fencing is a, is a martial art, so it's a fight. In the old time, it's always a pressure keep this correct style and technique. That's why it was fencing considered as an art. Later, changed the concept, it's a martial art, it's a fight. I don't think I'd fence if I couldn't compete. And probably the buzz of winning is really what keeps me doing that. It's not, not just in winning a bout, I think, but in, in just knowing that you've actually executed a move correctly. Uh, there is really a lot of satisfaction in that. I think that's a, one of the problems with the way that fencing is done today in, in competition. After the first month or two, they're already sent out there to fence. And so they get this immediate gratification of, of the competition. So then it becomes about the competition. Everything is about the competition and, and the fencing rather than the journey that you must take. Ah. Sports fencing is a game. Traditional fencing, which encompasses both the classical and historical, is not about competition. It is a martial art that is used for self-defense with a sword. It's not the art of offense, it's the art of defense.
if you get a top rank sport fencer and you get a top person in, in classical, it's going to be a very interesting bout. Neither has an advantage over the other, they're just different styles. So, if it's a martial art, winning is the important thing. To win the bout. Not how nicely I, I execute the movement and, and in what classical posture I, I, I stay. It has freed fencing to be a much more competitive um, sport, and, it, and that has also freed the fencers to pay less attention about the appearance of the action than the results of the action. And the electronic scoring equipment has freed the competitors to score touches at much higher speeds and, and use angles and you actually sometimes use the flexibility of the blade itself to place the point on parts of the target that would not be seen by a judge. All of that being said, what we spend a great deal of time doing is focusing on the disciplines of classical fencing. Um, everything that has gone before in the evolution of classical fencing is completely applicable to modern competition. The form, the technique, the balance and motion. All of the techniques of classical fencing are completely and entirely uh, applicable and indeed form the foundation of anything that a modern fencer would do. There is actually no distinction between the two, but there is a visible difference to the spectator when he or she observes. For the person who really intends to move into the higher levels of fencing and conceivably on a national or international level, that individual does indeed have to think of the importance of concentrating everything that he or she has on the bout and the moment within the bout. Which touch? How did they receive a touch? What can they do to counter the adversary's actions? And that has to become an absolute obsession and there's no easy way to arrive at that except one, to have a very sound technical foundation and two, the will to win. You can't accept the possibility that you're going to lose. When you go in, you have to fence to defeat your adversary. And you do that fairly and using all of the technical skills that you've acquired over the many years that you have taken fencing lessons and trained assiduously and perspired on the fencing strip. It was June 1975. We went to the World Cup tournament. Everyone was there. This was the last tournament before World Championships. I remember first day, I fenced very, very badly. I felt very badly. My performance was dreadful. Everything was such a hard work. And I was losing my decisive fight to be promoted for the next day. I was losing 4-2. And somehow I thought I'm not going to make it, but I managed somehow miraculously win this fight 5-4. And I remember 
Then we went to the hotel, it was quite late, and I remember I just couldn't sleep. I just couldn't sleep. I was kind of uh, in a, some kind of strange sta state of, 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 of emotions, if you like, engaging my emotional energy. And uh, next day, I haven't lost the fight. I beat absolutely everyone. I make the final. It was like a dream. It, this, it was difficult to describe. I knew that I'm in some kind of stage of inspiration or ecstasy or euphoria or dream or whatever you call it. And I knew that it takes lots of energy out of me. So I was <laughs> hoping that the final will finish sooner rather than later. And then when it finished, it was suddenly a release and uh, I won. I was just unbelievable taste of victory. It was you know, standing on the podium, getting the medals and listening to the national item. It was a fantastic moment, fantastic. I simply was born the wrong time in the wrong, wrong place. This part of Hungary was annexed by the Czechoslovak communist government. So I became communist state. One day, three o'clock in the morning, awaking, get up, just a small suitcase, the whole family in exile. The place, no electricity, no running water, simply in exile. Those circumstances, my father died of heart attack when he was 14 years old. My mother was paralyzed. My brother was this time uh, 16 years old, defected. I was uh, mentally very disturbed, suicide. What shall I do? And I learned pretty soon how to control myself. And not be controlled by thought and emotion. And then, when I learned this sport, I probably can get my education. So I utilized this ability to control my mind and my body, so I was able to experience the pleasure of competing, that I was free, I was not under the pressure that I had to win, I was simply just enjoying myself. So, whatever I read and I tried, I was highly motivated to do it. And this is the most important thing, to be motivated. I was motivated because my life was depending on it. I watched a tournament with somewhere between 120 and 150 spectators. Individuals who had no experience in fencing didn't know what was happening in the bouts, you know, uh, how they were doing it. And there was one particular bout where the fencer just applied everything correctly at the right time, right distance, everything was there so that it all happened in the right time, distance, and place. And as a fencer, to watch that, you go, oh, wow, that was great. But what was amazing to me was at the same time I'm doing that, and I know what's happening, I heard 120 to 150 people gasp, right? They didn't understand why it was good, but they understood that it was right. And it was that clear when it all comes together. It's an amazing thing to watch, whether you've been, you've never done this or you've been doing this for 30 years. You will still get a rush from watching it done correctly. Oh. Fencing saved my life. I grew up in one of the worst neighborhoods in the South Bronx in New York. But fencing to me pulled me out of that mindset, that uh, psychological mindset that when one grows up in, 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 a, in a, for a better word, it was a ghetto. It was a very bad place. Constant crime, drug addiction, things like that. And most people become tainted with that sort of thing. When I became involved in fencing, it really brought me out of myself. I was a very introverted, very shy person because I, I found that the whole environment was so unpleasant that I had to go in instead of out. 
Fencing gave me the ability to come out of myself and become a better person. I channeled my energy toward positive things instead of negative. And my fencing master actually saw that and he cultivated that in me and he decided that I was going to be a teacher. I took my forte my to his forte. I had no intention of becoming a fencing master at all. This sort of happened. I walked in, so to speak, uh, to, I wanted to only take it for a few weeks during the summer and I wound up spending 10 years at that school. I think I, I actually started fencing very late uh, for someone who is involved in it on the professional level that I am. Growing up, I think I was always fascinated by swordplay, and I'm, I'm sure it was one too many Earl Flynn movies at an impressionable age. In school, I had my, my career path had been uh, law. I was planning on going to law school, and I arranged to have a championship saber fencer come and teach some fencing courses and I managed to establish a fencing club at the college. So I began to have serious thoughts that there was some potential of making a living at this and I began to think that there were enough lawyers and not enough fencing masters. And that was a long and interesting phone call home when I called home to advise my parents that I was not going to be pursuing law school but that I was going to uh, pursue uh, a career in fencing. I remember there was a, a long silence on the other end of the phone, a very pregnant silence, and, uh, and my parents said, okay, and I have, I certainly, I think, I've had many attorneys say, I wish I was doing what you're doing, it looks like a lot more fun. <laughs> You don't have to think. You shouldn't, in fact, think about form when you're in competition and fencing. If everything that you've learned is in place, then it will all come of itself. On the best days, and one often wishes one could bottle this, you, mentally you, you get into this state, into this zone where you really have very little time to think, and yet you're totally aware of what's going on. There's a moment where you sort of come out of yourself, and you're beyond pain, you're beyond fatigue. Something enters into you where the art sort of takes over. So you spiritually, psychically, psychologically, you're no longer yourself. It does it through you. But under incredibly emotional state when you are when you, when you winning medals, gold medals are at, at, at stake, you are in such an incredible emotional state that all these things which you've done, actions, interactions, are like a second nature in your own muscles memory. Right? And uh, you are not realizing uh, often what you are doing. You are just performing and you are letting it go. And you find yourself doing things that you thought you, were, uh, you couldn't do. And sometimes when it's over you don't even remember it, but people tell you things that you've done. And there's a very fine line. And when you're fencing, if you're doing it right, your mind is empty, but yet you're still focused. And if you're doing it wrong, you're simply spacing out, thinking you're doing it right, when in fact you're not. And when you're spaced out for a second, that's when you get hit. You're completely aware of what's going on, but it is in that moment of response, of perception and response. To be in the present, to focus only what you are doing, and uh, not be controlled by thought and emotion. It's very difficult. In the 30 some odd years that I've been practicing this and teaching this, I've only experienced that one time and I feel myself very fortunate because there are many practitioners of varied martial arts who never experienced that. 
you need to be very detached and uh, in control of yourself. And when you do make that wonderful touch that involved no thinking, it's a great satisfaction because you started correctly from the beginning to the end. And so you try to make that as frequent as possible. And again, that's the great dilemma. How do you convince yourself to do something without thinking too hard about it? Uh, you have to clear your mind without completely spacing out. Meditation is one of the way how to approach this state because when we meditate we are trying to think only on one thing so that we block all the other negative thought. So if we meditate on a certain object or a certain word then we are eliminating all the other thought and we are getting in a calm state when we are in the present and this meditative state and we are in a deep relaxed state we are trying to get used how this state feel and to and to record the state when i was younger i used to believe very much in intellect intellectual powers controlling mind controlling your emotions now it seems to me that one has to let let go the emotional side because when you receive some signals, those signals go first to the emotional side of your brain before reaching the intellectual side. If you are under threat, you are mobilizing those emotional sides of your brain. You are not, your mind is not really working. Your subconscious side, your emotional side is taking over. You, you are reaching that state of being in Zen. So being in completely a state of freedom that your mind doesn't interfere with your subconscious and your body uh, and you perform like it feels like you are in a dream or in a slow motion films you see everything but you are not intellectualizing things as you become a better fencer it's a given consequence that uh, uh, you're moving up a certain level fencing without thinking I think the main improvement in my life from fencing, apart from all the fitness, health, travel sort of things, um, is in confidence. Fencing is all the technique of playing the violin, but then the athleticism of any other physical sport and the grace of ballet. Fencing permeates um, every aspect of my, my life condition. How to be detached, how to stand back and look at a situation at the moment in the best way that you can. It's definitely a respite to come from my daily, you know, working and to be able to come here and, and I may not be able to be successful there but I can I can win on this trip. And it's really about discipline, trying to be the best I can be at whatever I'm doing. Interacting with people, uh, develop, developing confidence. The courtesy, the kindness, the interest in other people, the analysis of what goes on in life. Self-control, you have to know where your body is, where your mind is, where your hand is, where your blade is, where the adversary is, how close he is. Fencing tends to make you very individualistic. There are no excuses other than yourself. If you fail, if you fail to win, you fail to touch, it's on you. Um, and a huge opportunity to learn more about yourself. A deeper understanding of myself and more confidence in, in what I know. When you see uh, the person that was seven years old, seeing how he's growing up as a fencer and as a person, this gives the satisfaction and the beauty and love of the love of this world. It's just a constant challenge. It just never ends, and it's just a thrill.
Judges, are you ready? Ready, ready. Fences, are you ready? ready. Sir. Fence.
motion of fencing is so disciplined and, and has to be so thoroughly trained that it's actually children who do not appear to be suited or adept at fencing early on that have evolved into some of our highest ranked junior fencers. I want the young person to really want to do it, really be passionate about it. A, a strong nervous system, person who want to perform to his best in, under tremendous pressure, has to have a strong nervous system and, and those people usually deliver a good performance. I think everyone can do this to a certain extent. And maybe and not everybody will be a champion, not everybody will be the, 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 the best fencer in the world, but. If you have an intelligence and a good brain, I think you can do this. The children who are initially attracted to it may or may not be the children who will do the best with it. Sometimes children find themselves attracted to fencing because of the sword fighting that they see in movies. Certainly I think that's what attracted me very, very early on. For a young student, it's an individual sport. That means he has to rely on himself. When competing, he learn to win. How does it feel? He learn also to lose. But they learn that the opponent, in fact, is a friend. The better the opponent, the more he can squeeze from himself. The kids here at the Fencing Academy, the ones who do well, the ones who do best, are the ones who have fun with it. something I actually coach my fencers at. They have to have fun, and it is. They, and they, the, the, the ones who really get into it and I think do best with it, they do. They have a lot of fun. 